Okay, good, good. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Daniel Chanskayon. I'm from North Montreal, a uh, startup company located in Sherbrooke, Quebec, Canada. Um, and today I want to present you some results about autonomous quantum correction of GPT-6. But before that, I would like uh, to join everyone and thank the organizers for this very nice workshop and also uh, to give, uh, give us the opportunity to present some updates on the results that we presented at the March meeting. Of course, now it doesn't work. Sorry. Okay, good. So because so many people have talked about GPP states uh, in this workshop, I can start with right away and just not even define what's a GPP state. I'll just simply remind you that, of course, we work with finite energy uh, GPP states, which is done by uh, imposing this kind of um, Gaussian envelope by penalizing our energy states. And um, we quantify this by this finite energy parameter delta. And throughout this talk, we will work with a single value, which is 0.36. So to give you an idea in terms of like number of photons and squeezing, this corresponds to about 3.5 photons and a squeezing of 9 dB. So this is a relatively small uh, GPT. So even though delta is quite large, we can still receive for these two logical states, plus x and minus x, we see that we can uh, quite well distinguish between these two. And with that, you can build up, let's say, the, what we call the GPP qubit, where we see all the cardinal states here. So what we want to do is perform quantum error correction in these states. And the idea is to use reservoir engineering. So the idea is that we will have a circuit that will engineer a dissipator such that the GPP manifold is the ground state manifold. And one reason to be excited about this is uh, all the progress that has been happening both experimentally and theoretically in the last few years in two platforms, so spunting circuits, but also trapped ions. So I'm sorry if I didn't cite explicitly uh, some papers here. Okay, so our, um, our hardware architecture is the kind of standard circuit PD architecture using three-dimensional microwave cavities. Um, so the GTP state will live in this, uh, in this cavity. Um, one thing which is quite nice in, in our case is that we, are, we have our local provider of high purity aluminum in Quebec. And with, with this, we can not only, not only control the purity of the aluminum, but also which impurities we want in that aluminum. So with this, without too much work, we can get about one millisecond of lifetime, except when the cavity ages a little bit badly, and then it can go down to about 0.3 milliseconds. This, of course, is not sufficient to do uh, GPP states. We need this nonlinear resource. And this is done using a standard transmon in the so-called coax line uh, architecture. Um, and then we also have this uh, resonator that we will use both for readout, but also for resetting the qubit state. So these auxiliary resources uh, first came from um, outside the company, from uh, Riken Quantum Computing um, uh, Center in Japan. But also recently, we have our own, um, let's say, supply of devices built in uh, in house. Obviously, we were not able for this uh, workshop to be able to get all the parameters right with our own devices. So now we couple these two by slightly inserting the chip inside the microwave cavity. Um, so here in this picture, it's highly exagger exaggerated, so the chip barely enters the cavity actually. So we work as uh, just the last talk in the small dispersive coupling regime where with chi of only about 10 kilohertz. And that leads directly to a self care of something about one hertz. And this is quite critical for GKP because the care effect will have a large effect. So in the end, basically what we have is that we make use of this, uh, the modularity of the 3D, 3D architecture to really work on the control and not so much on the hardware. But you see that uh, these lifetime are definitely not state of the art. So we have still uh, quite a lot of room for improvement. So in this pre presentation, I will show data from two devices. But the first device is the result that we presented at the March meeting this year uh, with a really small T1. And the second device um, slightly improved, so twice T1. Um, and these are very preliminary results that I will show toward the end of the presentation. Okay, so how can we make and quantum, uh, perform quantum error correction of the GKB state. So first thing we can do, of course, is a standard displacement. Um, so we just, for example, create a coherent state in the cavity. This, is, of course, is not sufficient. What we want to do is conditional displacement. 
meaning that we displace the cavity field conditional on the state of the other loop. And this, this is really natural if you have a Lunt non traction or radiation pressure interaction. That this is one of the reasons why this was achieved uh, in trapped iron first. I mean, not first, but kind of uh, naturally at, uh, uh, occurs in trapped iron. But this is not the interaction that we have nat natively in circuit QED. We have the dispersed interaction. Fortunately, uh, both uh, Philip and Alec developed the uh, so called echo conditional displacement that we also heard about in the last presentation. And the idea is that you uh, move your state in phase space, get a small rotation, and get back, and then you have a conditional displacement. If you only do that, you have a lot of other things that you don't want. So what you do actually is to do, you echo out the protocol, so you do a bipulse, and then you do the same thing in the opposite direction. And with this, in the end, what you get is something which is really close to a conditional displacement, up to two corrections that are quite easy. So the first one comes from the fact that you turn around the circle, so you need to correct for the fact that you kind of got back a little bit closer to the origin. Um, and this can be easily done by scaling the, la the last displacement here. The second correction is that if you draw carefully the path in phase space, you see that you do accumulate some geometric phase, uh, that, and this can be easily corrected with a virtual Z gate on the auxiliary qubit. So with this protocol, basically, if you do a pulse level simulations without any noise, you find that the infidelity is about 10 to the minus six for a reasonably uh, large conditional displacement. So this shows that this really implements a uh, conditional displacement. So currently what we're doing is that if, when we want to change the size of the conditional displacement, the only thing we change is the size of these displacements. This is definitely not time optimal, but this is kind of the simplest thing. And this is what we're doing currently. And uh, we're also working at this moment to uh, make it this more optimal. So currently, um, all conditional displacement takes about one microsecond, irrespective of the value of beta. So what's nice is that uh, people in Yale, Alec in particular, have shown that uh, if you have these conditional displacement and arbitrary rotation on your auxiliary qubit, uh, you can pa package that basically and build up a sequence that gives you universal control. And then you can create, in principle, any state in the storage. Um, so I'll, but then the problem becomes in how can you find, how do you find these parameters, these uh, values of rotation and conditional displacement? And just like in the last talk, you can just put that into an optimizer and find like candidates of parameters. And then you can pick, let's say, the, in the gate level submission, pick the one that gives you the best fidelity. Uh, one step more that we do is that we, let's say, take the 10 best candidates and then do a pulse level submission with noise to really find the set of parameters that gives us the best PDB. So in that case, the parameter is slightly device dependent, but we found that this is not, uh, this is still uh, better than just taking the uh, parameters from the gate level submission. So now we, what we do is we, uh, we take this initialization protocol and do it like a full experiment. So um, here we see whether we have a pre-reset and a reset. This I'll talk more about later in the talk. For now, the idea is that we initialize the state and then simply perform tomography. So usually people do Wigner tomography, but as we've heard in the last talk, um, in this case where we have a small chi, it's more natural to actually measure the characteristic function. And this is the good thing is that this can be done very easily uh, with a conditional displacement as demonstrated uh, in the, uh, some experiment with trapped ions. So this is what we get. So if we have this logical state minus X for delta 0.36, um, here the circuit depth is about nine, it's nine for a total duration of about 12 microseconds. And what we end up is this state. So quantitatively it looks relatively good, but now we can, go to, we can look a little bit more quantitatively about the fidelity of that state. So to do, to do this, we uh, perform state reconstruction inspired from the uh, method in this paper. And here we take the fidelity, uh, the definition of the fidelity with the square root, which kind of arbitrarily boosts up a little bit the fidelity. So this is what it looks like. So this is the ideal finite energy GKP state. This is what we have in simulation. And here the full simulation is really the full simulation in the sense that we do a possible simulation. We also simulate the measurement of the characteristic function, and we go through the same process 
of reconstructing the density matrix. So it really goes the same, almost the same path through as the experiment. And finally, we have the experiment with fidelities of about 82%. So this is one logical state, and we can do the other two logical states, which are completely independent. Uh, and we see that fidelities are again about 82%. Uh, 82%. And then we can really, uh, and the three, uh, three other um, cardinal states are obtained simply by a 90 degree rotation. So they can be obtained for, uh, for free given these three states. So what's nice is that you see in this graph is that we have a quantitative agreement with numerical simulations without any fitting parameter, the infidelity uh, is fits within a few percent from the experiment. And then we can use these uh, simulations to actually um, build up an error budget. And without any surprises, we see that most of the errors comes from decay of the auxiliary qubit during the initialization protocol. So this is not a big surprise, but now we can be quantitative about that. And we see this accounts for 77% 70, 70, uh, of the errors. Okay, now how can we do quantum error correction on these days? So as I said, the idea is to build up a circuit that engineers a dissipator such that the GTP manifold is a ground state manifold. And one such circuit is the so-called SBS protocol proposed by Betsy's way in 2020. Um, and in this protocol, you have three pairs of rotation and console displacement, plus at the end, a reset and one last rotation, which just makes the reset a bit easier. So now this, the name of this protocol comes from the fact that these, the first and the third console displacement are small, and the one in the middle, uh, in the middle is big. And actually, if these are the exact values, and if you just put take the limit of delta going towards zero, what you see is that the big displacement is simply a uh, conditional displacement by one lattice parameter, and then the small displacement just goes to zero. So these are basically just a uh, finite energy correction to a simple measurement of the stability. So these are parameters, let's say, for the first round. And then what we do for a subsequent round, we just multiply these numbers by i. And this does two things. First thing is that it naturally kind of rotates uh, stabilize, uh, alternate between both gradatures. So we can stabilize X, P, and so on. And also the fact that uh, after two, two, round, two rounds, basically we have accumulated the minus sign. And this basically changes, it symmetrizes things. Because let's say you do control displacement, this is G and E. If you have a relaxation event, this will kind of uh, screws up things in one way. So by changing the sign, then it symmetrizes back everything. So this is what we call the default SBS protocol. We, what we can do on top of that is to try to parameterize, to optimize that. And the way we decided to do it is to basically have only a few uh, parameters to do it. So one thing is that you could say that, well, this delta here in these equations could be in principle different than the delta that you, you initialize. One last thing also inspired by uh, the work from Yale by Vlad in particular, is that they've seen that their optimizer gave different amplitude for the two small displacements. So naturally, we just add that as an optimization parameter. And finally, uh, because of the always on this person interaction with the system, the state will rotate and we need to follow that. We need to be to apply the stabilization along the right axis. So we need to follow the rotation and this is just an optimization parameter. So one thing we've not discussed so far is this reset which is really, really necessary for the quantum recreation, quantum recreation pro protocol to kind of remove entropy from the system. So this reset can be implemented by a measurement followed by feedback operation. But in our case, we do it in a feedback-free manner. And the idea, simple idea is that we will swap the excited strain of the qubit to the very lossy resonator, which will decay back to the ground state uh, in a relatively fast manner. And this is why we call that a dissipative swap. So we swap excitation between qubit resonator, but because it decays back, it's kind of a uh, unidirectional interaction. So with this, you can easily, you see that if you're in the second excited state of the transmog, you go back to the ground state uh, very easily. Um, but then to also reset the first excited state, what we do is we simply prepend this dissipative swap with the pi poles between EF transition. So with this, if you do this kind of uh, one round of this reset, you can uh, reset the first excited state. If it happened that you were in the second excited state at the beginning, 
then uh, the system is shelved on the first excited state for the first round, and then it will be reset at the second round. So you can see very naturally that you can repeat this process a given number of times to just improve the performance. So you can see that as the stabilization of the auxiliary qubit ground state. So this is useful also, for example, to keep very cool the cold the qubit. So here, what we see is that as a function of this number of dissipative swaps, we look at the average reset error. And this average reset error is defined as the probability to not be in the ground state, average over preparing the qubit in the ground state, first or second excited state. So the idea is that unconditional on this initial state, we want to go back to the ground state. So what we see is that uh, this quickly decays to about 1% with only two dissipative swaps and then can reach almost 10 to the minus four with a reasonable number of, uh, of swaps. So for the rest of, of the presentation, for reasons that I can discuss offline, uh, we will stick to this uh, simpler case of only two dispositive swaps, where basically to, uh, the fidelity of this operation is about 99%. And this takes only 400 nanoseconds. So this is, in most cases, faster than doing emergement and a feedback. Uh, which accounts for not only the time of the measurement, but also the latency of the feedback uh, protocol. So with this, basically, we can make the quantum recreation protocol completely autonomous. And this is something that is uh, we find which is quite nice. So now we can put everything together. So we have this initialization protocol, and now we can look at what the resets do. So the first one is simply used as a pre-reset, meaning that we the initial qubit, uh, qubit thermal population can be reduced by this pre-reset. And then this reset here uh, just gets, a, a, the insertion protocol of course has some errors. So in the end, we have some entanglement between the qubit and the cavity, and this entanglement can be removed um, mostly through this reset here. And then we start to do this, these SDS quantum error correction round a given number of time. And then finally, we perform thermography to kind of do the decoding of the code. So um, now we've switched to like the second device. So things are a bit uh, faster. So insertion takes 10 microseconds. Each round of SDS takes 3.5 microseconds. And tomography takes two microseconds, including the readout time. So you, you might have seen that I've added this idle time here. And this is kind of, we use that as an initial optimization parameter. And the idea is that we're trying to correct for photon losses, but doing so we're making errors because of, trend, of the auxiliary qubit. So the idea is that in principle, given the noise, there's an optimal rate of quantum error correction. And so this is something that we will optimize. So what we'll measure, instead of measuring the full characteristic function, we will measure only a few points in order to extract the logical fidelity. So the logical fidelity is given by this. So the idea is that we look at basically the distance between uh, opposite uh, cardinal states in the block sphere. So as the, as the uh, decoherence occurs, these will collapse toward the center. So this measure is basically a uh, measure of the query, the logical fidelity. And these uh, body expectation values are simply measurement of the real part of the characteristic function at the right point in phase space. So if you want to measure X, you measure here, Y and Z, you measure at those points. So it's a very simple measurement. So now we perform uh, optimization of the quantum correction, quantum error correction protocol. So we use Bayesian optimization uh, with Gaussian processes with this package. Um, and here we have four parameters. So there's the three parameters that we've discussed before, this kind of effective delta, the ratio between the two small displacements, and this kind of rotation that we need to keep track of. And now we've added this idle time that intuitively we understand why there should be a non-zero optimal value. And for what we do is that we evaluate the logical fidelity uh, after a given number of rounds. In this case, it will be four rounds. And then we estimate the logical lifetime uh, assuming an exponential decay. And this is necessary, otherwise it will penalize like longer idle time. And this is what we have. So here we look at the logical fidelity versus the optimization iteration. And we see that it kind of slowly goes up until reaching an optimal point here. I mean, a maximum point. Um, you see that there's a lot of like dips, 
this could either be exploration phases of the optimization algorithm or the device going bad for some time. So now we can look a little bit more deeply at the same data set, but now looking as function of three of the four parameters, and we can see kind of trends in there. So what we see is that the optimization push the delta to larger values, meaning that given the noise that we have, it shows that we should actually add a smaller um, uh, GKP state. And also you see that it pushes us to relatively long values of the idle time. Is it five minutes of my presentation or five minutes? Five minutes of your presentation. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, yeah, so basically what we see is that optimization really pushes up uh, outside of like the default protocol. And this, especially this value of the ratio between the two small displacement is quite consistent with what was found by Vlad experiment, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, good. Um, yeah. Good, so now we can validate this optimization by really measuring the logical lifetime in a proper manner. So this is what we have here. So here, this is the logical fidelity in the log scale versus the uh, time. So each point is a given number, is a number of round. So you see that we only do a few rounds. So this is a very different regime than uh, Vlad's results yesterday. Uh, so this is kind of a figure of merit that we need to improve. But nevertheless, what we see is that um, the logical lifetime is improved by the optimization, but more, uh, more uh, interestingly is that the uh, logical lifetime with quantum, quantum correction is better than when we do nothing. So with this, what we can say is that we're above what we call the quantum error correction break-even, meaning that we start to correct more error than, our, than that are generated by our protocol. And to put this in perspective, it may, say, it may seem a little bit stupid, but actually you can put this in perspective by comparing with uh, approaches of surface code with transmog, for example, from the last few years. And even though the, these experiments are very impressive, actually two of them are below quantum reaction break-even. And uh, one at Google, if I'm not mistaken, was right at this quantum correction break-even. But with Bosnian code, I don't, I don't need to convince you, but with Bosnian code, the one thing which is really nice is that you can reach that with a single logical qubit and one auxiliary qubit. And in some codes, even you don't even need the auxiliary qubit. And I think the state of the art is definitely what we've seen yesterday from Vlad, initial developers group yesterday um, uh, at Yale, where they show that not only can they can pass the quantum action break even, but also the Fox state uh, break even, which is even harder. Um, and the main, if you're wondering what's the differences between what was shown yesterday and what we're doing, the main two differences is that our transmogs are much worse, about 10 times worse. Um, but also like uh, in uh, Vlad's work, the feedback, uh, the reset was done by a feedback process. In our case, we do it autonomous. So in conclusion, we've demonstrated autonomous contraction of the GKP qubit with a feedback free uh, reset. We've performed closed loop optimization of the quantum correction, quantum error correction parameters. And we're currently working on including more and more things into this optimization to improve things. And uh, what is quite different from what we presented at the March meeting is that now we've kind of uh, really increased this kind of gain from quantum correction. It's still very small, but definitely much better than three months ago. That's good. Uh, and now we're starting to correct actually more errors than we're generating. And uh, I put this to kind of set myself to do it. Actually, the results should be on archive very soon, hopefully next month. But I think we, I, I want to finish with, I think the big question remaining is how can we make the quantum correction robust to auxiliary errors? This is a really big question that we're working on. So with this, uh, just before thanking you, I want to just, I, I like the team uh, at Nafmantik in Sherbrooke. And if you're interested uh, in what we do, you can uh, come to talk with Florian, which is right there, and also newcomer Nick, which is also right there. And also with this, thank you for your attention. We have time for several questions. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. So in chapter ones, we also have this uh, like this a bit of reset, but I see it as a disadvantage. And here it seems like you even would have the time budget to measure to reset and even gain some information about the errors you have. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, exactly. So this is a really natural extension of what we're doing. So we're doing a measurement, 
and then then you're more free into like the measurement can be non QND in that case because then you can have your reset to uh, to, uh, to clean things up, and then if you don't do any feedback, then you can use that information for let's say uh, post processing, post selection, something like that, or you can use that maybe in a second layer of quantum error correction. So our, our, our ideas we're trying to avoid to have like inline feedback, really like tightly time, and that really you're you're waiting for this information to get back uh, to do something. Thanks for the talk, very nice. Uh, I was wondering, because like the SBS protocol has been developed for stabilizing a symmetric GKP code, so the symmetric in Q and P uh, direction in this phase space. Have you thought of like using or trying to use a different uh, ANSAS, basically trying to use two different parameters for the same delta, so delta for Q or delta for P? Okay, uh, no, we've not tried that or thought about that. Um, so, to me, that will lead to definitely some kind of bias in the, in the qubit, basically kind of similar to a rectangular GKP uh, qubit, and I don't think there's any advantage into that, but maybe I need to think more about it. Um, do you have some answers to this last question you asked about, like, uh, controlling ancillary errors? Um, I mean, of course, there's kind of... Um, obvious ideas that are out there and tried. Um, so there's the idea of using a, so it's not really making it transparent to errors, but reducing the errors of the ancilla for using, for example, using a bias uh, qubit as the auxiliary, uh, for example, a care cat. This is, there's some effort in Yale about that, but there, I think this is very challenging. The, idea, the other idea is to uh, make, use a more robust encoding, for example, some kind of multi-mode uh, GKP state that actually there's then there's some there's a paper by Betis showing that in that case you can maybe uh, even though you could have an error during your protocol this error cannot uh, could maybe not lead to a logical error so these are two um, ideas that are out there and we're also trying to think about uh, yeah nice talk uh, thanks um, uh, all right I'm going to push back on nomenclature though uh, so. I like the spirit of like, is my error correction protocol introducing more errors? In? However, you're proposing QEC breakeven where we use the term breakeven for QEC. I think this is going to, and they're quite different. And I think this is going to be confusing for people if I've understood correctly what you were saying. But um, it also makes it seem like if you had a code with a lot more overhead, so like when I encode, it gets a lot worse. Then it lowers the bar for what you're calling QEC break even. So yeah, um, I guess my request is let's come up with a different term for that. Okay, okay. <laughs> this I'm completely up to it. Like this QEC break even came up uh, like a few weeks ago and we didn't highly debate it. For two years, we called that the soft break even because it's definitely not as hard as passing the kind of hard even which is being the best system. So I think there's definitely a room for debate and I'm happy to discuss more with you. Okay. Um, to us, it makes sense to, yeah, compare like your, you start with the same fidelity, like the, like the initialization is the same, there's no overhead there. And then you just start your quantum error, correct, quantum error correction and you're wondering like, you gain from that. This is what we're trying to, I'm happy to discuss. Thanks for the nice talk. Okay. Um, so I'm curious about your reset protocol and in particular why you use this sort of discretized version where you reset that seven step loop. Yeah. As opposed to say a continuous version where you drive that ES transition uh, continuously as you do the other one. Uh, yeah. Do you see any advantage there? Yeah. So uh, for a long time, we, we use this kind of uh, what we called um, sequence, uh, not, we call that the sequential reset where you do things bang, bang. Uh, then we also did this uh, continuous uh, case. What we found was that for some reason, the continuous case is much harder to calibrate. In this case, it's quite easy because pulses are quite, I mean, uh, timely, uh, separated in time. So what you do is really you calibrate your pipe here, you calibrate your swap, and boom, that's it. There's not much to optimize. The only thing left to optimize is kind of this 
time that you wait before the next round, just that such that this decays, and then you just say, I'll take 5T1 of the resonator, and that's fine. Um, so we found that it's much better in experiment, it's much easier in experiments. And also in numerical estimation, we also found that it performed better for the same time. Uh, but then we didn't dig uh, more much deeper into understanding fundamentally why it behaves better in this discrete manner. The last question right there. Hi, yeah, thanks for a really nice talk. Okay. I was just wondering, you did this, this Bayesian uh, optimization and you found that, if I'm not mistaken, you found that the, the idle times that it found were like it increased the idle times of your protocol. So can you maybe comment on why you think maybe this? Yeah. Way? Yeah. So um, if you, okay. So the, the, the idea of this idle time is to kind of balance out your uh, errors that you do during quantum error correction in your photon one. And if you do a quick back of the envelope calculation for that, you find that the optimal idle time should be much shorter than what we find. So we think that this indicates that we're making way more errors than we should be on this protocol. But the thing is that because these results are really new, we don't have the numerical summation. So up to that point, I will show you like matching numerical summation that tells us that we're doing the right thing. Here, we don't have it yet. It's an ongoing. So uh, the, what I think will happen is that we'll find that something, something is wrong. I mean, something is miscalibrated and that once we fix this, fix this, this will push back the optimal idle time to shorter. Okay, so let's thank uh, Jenny again for a wonderful talk.